Hey everyone, welcome to Courtside, a discussion of legal issues. And today I want to talk about something I've been thinking about all week, as I know many of you have, the recent rise in hate crimes against Asian Americans, and specifically what happened in Atlanta. And I want to explore with you a bit about what hate crimes are and how the law deals with them and what you and I can do to make this country a bit better. I'm not going to pretend this subject is anything but personal. This is the only court side in 75 episodes in which I'm not going to tell jokes. I don't have any to tell about this subject. I'm sure someone like John Oliver could pull it off. I'm no John Oliver. So I'm just going to tell you just, you know, how I'm feeling and what the law is. And, you know, many of us have been in tears all week as we watched um, descriptions of what happened. And as an Asian man um, who grew up in Chicago, uh, you know, it brings back a lot of very painful memories for me. Things that were said, things that were done to my parents, to their friends, to our community. And it pains me to no end. I remember so vividly when these things were happening, I said to myself, you know, I'm seven, I'm 10, I'm 15, but the world's gonna get better. This is a blip. They are, you know, I didn't know this vocabulary then, but you know, I felt in my heart that the arc of progress was going to bend toward justice. And in general, it's gotten better. But then over the last several years, we've had a constitutional monster in the Oval Office, someone who preyed on our fears and exploited these racist and sometimes sexist attitudes, you know, and called it, you know, stupid things like China virus or Wuhan flu nonsense. None of this is a crime, what he said. I mean, it's a crime against humanity, but it's not formally a violation of the criminal law. But he bears a lot of moral responsibility for the situation we're in now. But the law is going to deal with it. So this killer, Mr. Robert Long, is likely going away to jail for an incredibly long period of time, probably for his life. The death penalty may even be on the line as well. Indeed, in Georgia, the minimum sentence for a murder is life in prison. You do have the possibility of parole after 30 years. And Long has been charged with eight different counts of murder. And it's up to the district attorney to decide now what exactly to do in terms of pursuing the hate crimes enhancement. So Georgia has a law that um, it's only a year old, uh, you know, but it's one that does provide for an increase in the sentence for up to two years. If a crime of violence is motivated by some sort of animus on the basis of race or other characteristics. Now, up until last year, Georgia didn't have such a law. It was one of only four states that didn't have a law. But after the killing of Ahmed Arbery, uh, there were, you know, in all the protests and the like, Georgia did create such a law. Now, Georgia's law is like the law in many states. A hate crime is not a standalone offense. And so it's an enhancement for a crime you have already deemed committed for something else. So you can't get arrested for a hate crime. You can get arrested for a crime, and then your sentence can be enhanced if the crime was motivated by, in Georgia, someone's race, color, religion, national origin, sexual orientation, gender, or mental or physical disability. And as I say, it is a mandatory enhancement for two years in Georgia. Now, you could ask, this guy, Mr. Long's looking at a life sentence, possibly even the death penalty. What's the point of a hate crime? And the point is because criminal law is not just about length of sentence. It's about labels. It's about reflecting a person's offense and labeling it the correct thing. And... There are different gradations of murder. There are some murders that are worse than others. That's why we have first degree, second degree, and the like. But there are also crimes, including murders, that take place with extra stuff, extra horrible stuff behind them. And here, that's what a hate crime is. You know, Emil Durkheim, the famous sociologist over 100 years ago, said the point of criminal sanctions is to make the community whole again, to create some coherence in it. Obviously, you can't bring the victims back. No prosecutor is 
able to do something like that. But you are able to reflect the gravity of the offense, to label it what it is, and to allow the community to repair itself. Calling these crimes just murder doesn't capture the gravity of what happened. The crimes are broader than the individual victim. And so for that reason, that's the most important reason why I think the Georgia prosecutors, based on so far the public record, and maybe there's other stuff, but so far that's why these cases have to be brought and labeled as hate crimes. And it's very important for Georgia to start to bring those cases, particularly in something like this, because that creates the development of a body of law so that in future cases, we're not just writing on a blank slate. So that's Georgia. By the way, there's also a federal hate crime statute, the Shepard Bird Act, that makes it a federal crime to cause bodily damage based on a victim's race, color, religion, um, or national origin. And there's a part of the law that does apply to crimes motivated by sexual orientation and gender identity. It's a more narrow thing, but that is there as well. Now, the issue with both federal and state hate crimes laws is it's really hard to prove. The prosecutor has to show beyond a reasonable doubt, that means all 12 jurors have to agree beyond a reasonable doubt that a crime was motivated by animus. And this is where criminal law and criminal procedure intersect. Because in the American system, we don't allow prosecutors to read people's minds um, or to compel their testimony. You all know this from TV. You have the right to remain silent. So it's hard for a prosecutor to prove someone was motivated by hate when the defendant just clams up and says nothing. Um, and as a result, hate crimes are rarely charged. Only about 15% of federal, time, federal cases uh, in which a state recommends a hate crime enhancement be brought are brought. So it's very low. And that's a real problem, particularly given the recent rise in crimes against the Asian American community, up over 150% in these violent incidences in the last year. And then you have prosecutors who make excuses for not bringing hate crimes, uh, you know, uh, indictments. So we're already hearing right now that in Georgia, this, these Atlanta shootings were on the, motivated by on the basis of sex, not on the basis of any sort of animus. But race and gender intersect, particularly in the mind of this killer. Uh, he apparently has an issue, something that he called a sex addiction at one point, indeed, uh, addiction at one point. Indeed, the um, the Cherokee County captain, Mr. Baker, said, you know, that he viewed these Asian massage parlors that Mr. Long did as a temptation for him that he wanted to eliminate. Now, this is the same guy who said that Mr. Long just really had a bad day and stuff like that. So I don't want to use this as the barometer of, you know, of truth by any stretch. But I do think what Mr. Baker is saying reflects a general view out there that this crime was motivated by maybe gender or maybe by you know sexual gratification, but not by animus. And of course, anyone who knows anything about the history of this country knows you can't just neatly cleave those things one to another. And for something to be a hate crime, you don't have to have the killer saying, you know, as he's pulling the trigger, I hate Asians or something like that. You know, the fact is six Asian women have been killed in Asian massage parlors that this guy, Mr. Long, specifically frequented for sex. And the idea that because sex and gender were involved, that somehow makes it not racial animus is just plain stupid. If anything, the two types of discrimination, race and gender, mutually reinforce one another. Asian women have been subjected to these kinds of prejudices for hundreds of years. The Page Act of 1875 forbade Chinese women from immigrating to the United States under the pretense that they could basically only be prostitutes. And we've had all sorts of horrible stereotypes ever since that time. And so the question is, what can you and I do about it? And I think there are four things. One, we need better data and better reporting. I know this better than anyone. When you see some sort of crime of hate, it's just easy to look the other way. It's easy to forget. It's easy to just, it's embarrassing. It's degrading. And you don't want to go to enforcement, law enforcement or something like that. 
And I know that there are a lot of Asian Americans who watch this uh, episode, watch this series. And so I'm speaking specifically to you. If you see an incident, report it. The National Association of Asian Pacific Bars uh, members, at NAPABA, is a group of 50,000 Asian American lawyers, and they have an intake form on their website. Fill it out, please. Second, we can com support community organizations. The a AAPI Community Fund is one. There are local organizations as well, but all of these, I think, are important to do. Third, we can hold our leaders to account for their rhetoric. He who shall not be named bears a lot of responsibility, but many others do too. And we shouldn't just let this stuff get a free pass uh, because we like the guy's politics, if any of you do, um, or anything else. This has no place in our democracy. And lastly, we need to think about some new hate crimes legislation. Right now, there is no person at the Justice Department in Washington who's responsible for hate crimes. I remember when I was there, we had a few cases involving hate crimes, and there was no centralized place, no central repository, no location for institutional knowledge. We need that. There's pending legislation that would fix that right now and create a staff for dialogue between federal and state officials. So I'm asking you to do any of these four, all of these four, hopefully. And that way, one day, the arc of justice will start bending again in the right direction. Thank you. See you next week.